<laughs> Thank you for your patience, everybody. My name is Kate Johnson, and I am the director of the Ethics and Social Justice Center here at Bellarmine University. I want to welcome you to today's event, the 2023 Commonwealth Ethics Lecture. The goal of this lecture series is to promote ethics education across the curriculum and to showcase the ingenuity of Kentucky scholars. Bellarmine University is committed to be a place of personal, academic, spiritual, and ethical formation and growth. The Ethics and Social Justice Center support these goals by encouraging critical reflection, dialogue, constructive action in contemporary issues in society. I am really pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Eric Thomas Weber. Dr. Weber is an Associate Professor of Educational Policy Studies and Evaluation and Affiliated Faculty in Philosophy and in the Honors College at the University of Kentucky. He also serves as Executive Director of the Society of Philosophers in America, also called SOFIA. On behalf of SOFIA, he produced and co-hosted the syndicated Philosophy Bakes Bread radio show and podcast on WRFL Lexington. 88.1 FM from 2007 to 2016, he was assistant and then associate professor of public policy leadership and affiliated faculty member in the School of Law and Department of Philosophy at the University of Mississippi. His latest book is titled America's Public Philosopher and was published in 2021 with Columbia University Press. Dr. Weber's lecture today is titled Kentucky's Potential for Leadership in Educational Ethics, Calling for an End to Corporal Punishment in American Schools. Please welcome Dr. Weber. Thank you. Hello, and, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, some of you at the very back, unless your eyes are very good, there may be a few slides that could be harder to read. And if you wanted to come forward, this would be a good time for it. But also, if you make use of your uh, smart devices, you can use this QR code to get this file, and you can see it on your phone. So you don't need to squint if you wish to, to do that. If you can't use a QR code, you can use the little link etw, which are my initials, dot li, which is for link, slash ky, so Kentucky Ed Ethics. Okay. Um, you may wish to see this in part to be able to read it when, when the, if the font gets too small, but also because there's a number of, of um, philosophers don't have to reference a lot of data points. We can do a lot with just a few sometimes, but uh, <clears throat> in, in the context of studying and teaching public policy, as I've done quite a bit, uh, I find the more you can familiarize yourself with the facts, uh, the more compelling your arguments can be. Can everyone hear me OK? Excellent. I have a booming voice sometimes, but I also just got over a cold, and so uh, that might make me quieter. All right, well, thank you again for coming. First thing I want to do, of course, is to um, thank my hosts. So first of all, all of you who are here and those of you who are joining us online, thank you for being here, but especially thank you to Dr. Kate Johnson and to the Ethics and Social Justice Center here at Bellarmine University. You just heard about the aims and purposes of the center, so I won't repeat this, but um, I think it's nice to note in part because it helps to contextualize you know, why this was interesting to me to come join you all, because I care very deeply about the notion of you know, ethics being taught across the curriculum which is why I'm a philosopher teaching in a college of education, right? And uh, I care in, in that context deeply about interdisciplinarity uh, as well as regional issues. Uh, when I was at the University of Mississippi for nine years, as you heard, um, I was deeply concerned with problems of education and injustice in Mississippi. Uh, and uh, my before last book was a book about Mississippi actually and its problems, not just for interest for people in Mississippi, but because you know, Mississippi is sort of a small version of the United States in terms of its problems of race and some of the other things, right? Uh, and so it's called Uniting Mississippi Democracy and Leadership in the South. Um, for today, I like to put it up front and, and boldly, here's my target, my thesis is uh, explicitly that I argued for an end to corporal punishment 
in Kentucky schools uh, and a, dial a public dialogue involving teachers, community members, and scholars about the least harmful and most beneficial alternative methods for behavioral guidance. I didn't say for punishment or for discipline. Though discipline is not as bad a word, right, uh, for our purposes. But with such an effort, if we do this, and, and I think this kind of thing is coming, at least the first part, an end to corporal punishment, although I'm not sure about this, and, and you'll see why in a little bit. Um, I think Kentucky can be a significant leader in educational ethics, and, and that's, that's where we're heading. <clears throat> so I want to tell you a little bit about the facts as, as I understand them. Uh, I have uh, re substantially reviewed this literature, and corporal punishment has kind of been a, an example for me in many of my projects. And this paper, this presentation, is sort of making it my focus uh, in a way that I haven't done before in terms of this kind of depth. Uh, and so uh, another reason why this was exciting for me to think about. So I'll talk about the facts, and then I'm going to go over uh, what I take to be uh, insights of great value from ethics and philosophy for thinking about the policy issue of corporal punishment, as well as its alternatives. <clears throat> and then I'll end briefly with some thoughts about what Kentucky may be able to do uh, in terms of its potential for leadership. So what are the facts in terms of what is corporal punishment? A reasonable question. And what are the trends? Uh, what's the trend? So, <coughs> excuse me. Kentucky defines corporal punishment as follows. The deliberate infliction of physical pain by any means. So that could be a paddle, a hand, a rod, uh, there's a number of different options. Upon the whole or any part of a student's body as a penalty or punishment for student misbehavior. On a number of these slides, because people may be interested in checking what I had to say, uh, and in following some of the links I'll be including in the slides, I, I include this again a few, you know, in a few slides just in case you want to follow a link that I share. Um, okay, so you know, what are the trends in, in terms of the United States as a whole? In 2002, uh, that school year, 2002 to 2003, there were 300,000 uh, recorded instances. And it'll vary by state, but when I was at the University of Mississippi for, for many years, when I began studying this material, a, an instance of corporal punishment was up to five strikes of a paddle recorded as, as one instance, right? <clears throat> In 2006 to 2007, there were 223,000, and then 2013 to 2014, 109,000. So clearly we're on a downward trend, and I think that's a positive thing. But as we've seen in a number of matters in recent years, there are many policy issues where things went one way and they, they, they've been swinging back. And, and we'll get to that in a moment. And so you wanna, uh, you can think optimistically that perhaps if you, if you care for this policy to end and the practice to end, you might think that it's a good thing and that it's on the way out, but these things are surge. <clears throat> in Kentucky in particular, the, the numbers are very promising in terms of where we're going, right? We had only 3,000 instances uh, in the state of Kentucky in the year 2004 to 2005. And so for some people, they ask, well, why is this an issue if we don't have that many cases compared to, you know, uh, well, if it's your child, those cases matter profoundly for one thing, let alone, by the way, if it's not your child getting struck. The effects of corporal punishment that we're going to get to in a little bit are not only upon the student who's been struck, but all those students who witness as well. The environment is different when there's corporal punishment. We'll get to that. A few years later, there were almost, half, you know, it, it's close to half the number. That's a big drop. Into 2019, in the state of Kentucky, four and a half million people, only 284 recorded instances. And then in the last year for which there's data that I found anyway, 17 instances. So those who want to defend the practice, you might ask, well, how come there's so few instances then? Why is it, why do you think it's so needed? Right, if so many places aren't using it, why do we need to do this anymore? Right. <clears throat> Counties, by the way, in which this is used, uh, at least in the last year, data are Bell County and Pike County in uh, the Appalachian region. Uh, for now, anyway, we have 
Kentucky uh, Education Commissioner Jason Glass. I say for now because in another year or so we may get a different governor and different education commissioner and they can have very different points of view about these things, right? Commissioner, uh, uh, education Commissioner Jason Glass has referred to corporal punishment as a barbaric practice. That's not an equivocal uh, assessment. So maybe it's on its way out. Seems like it, right? That's a good thing. I haven't perhaps yet convinced anyone, uh, but we'll see. <clears throat> what are the facts? So in 2018, uh, the 67,000 member organization of the American Academy of Pediatrics um, came to the conclusion that they needed to clearly and strongly oppose the use of corporal punishment given the evidence and that they stated very clearly corporal punishment harms children. It's not easy to convince such an association of such a thing, right? Uh, first of all, one uh, important fact you need to keep in mind, and we'll be coming back to this, is that corporal punishment is used disproportionately, especially on black male students and students with disabilities. I have a, a daughter who is disabled, and I also live in Lexington, Kentucky, in which corporal punishment is not permitted. But, right, kids like my daughter in other counties are getting struck. In fact, the data point in which I mentioned only 17 cases were recorded in the last year. I think it was 2020 to 2021. I, we can go back to the slide if you wish. In fact, you can on your phone. Um, in that year, seven of the 17 recorded cases uh, were undertaken with a child with disabilities. Those of you who got the slides, and by the way, if you want to, you can get this right here. You can click on this picture. <coughs> this is um, a map of the state of Mississippi, and I lived in this green spot. That's Oxford, Mississippi, in which corporal punishment isn't allowed. 30 minutes away in South Panola, and we can click on it if you want, but then I'll have to get back into the PowerPoint and so forth. But if you have your phone, you can click on it, you can see. South Panola, Kentucky, 30 minutes away, not a very big population. In a 180 school day year, they recorded 2,572 cases of corporal punishment. That's not far from what the whole state of Kentucky used in one of the data points I showed you, right? And I think it was the 20, 2009 to 2010 year, you, you can check it. But um, I just don't want to go back and forth outside of the PowerPoint and come back in. But um, the state of Mississippi is the state that uses it in highest proportion. The state of Texas uses it in largest amount, but they have a larger population, much larger population, right? Now, interestingly, the state of Mississippi was convinced about the problem of hitting kids disproportionately who have disabilities. They passed a bill in 2019, Mississippi House Bill 1182. Right, which prohibits public school employees from striking students with disabilities. To my mind, that's progress. Presumably, Mississippi thinks so too, otherwise they wouldn't have passed the bill. Right? Nonetheless, two points, this is less directly to that, but um, in Missouri, another M state, but a different one, right? Um, corporal punishment is making a comeback. There's no reason that couldn't be true in a many in many states in the next couple of years. People think it needs to come back, and it'll come back because it's still permitted legally in 19 states. Uh, and in March, this was the uh, I read about it on the 15th. That's when the piece was published. <clears throat> the, I, the the headline says Oklahoma Republicans stopped the bill. It's important to note that we shouldn't be too biased about parties. The bill was a Republican bill that sought to ban the hitting of disabled kids at school in Oklahoma, and fellow Republicans, state senators, opposed it and blocked it. It failed just two weeks ago in Oklahoma. So Mississippi, which uses it in highest proportion, decided not to strike kids with disabilities. But Oklahoma said, wait, why not? We'll get to that. Uh, any, any questions before I move on? 
Okay. So, uh, forgive the pun, hard hitting facts, okay? As I mentioned, 19 states continue to use corporal punishment in schools, even though it has been shown to have many harmful associations and effects. Now, that terminology is really important. Right, because when you do science, when you do social science, it is hard to do this work and get published and to show associations. But associations can be mere correlations, right? If someone, you know, is you know can hit something high when they jump, well, that might be correlated to being tall. Doesn't mean a short person can't jump very high, like Spud Webb could. Maybe you don't know that name, right? A basketball player from a long while ago. Right? Spud Webb was short, but he could dunk, right? But the mo majority of people who can dunk are pretty tall, right? That's an association. You don't want to say, you know, people are tall because they can dunk. That doesn't make sense, right? You'd say they can dunk because they're tall, perhaps. So my point is, when you say mere associations, you don't know which is the causal relation necessarily. You have to learn that. It's hard to prove, to show a causal relation between things, but that is what has been shown. Okay. Between what and what? When you employ practices of corporal punishment, there are higher rates of aggression among kids. Higher rates of depression. There's worse performance in schools. These links are where you can read about this stuff. I mean, I can put a bunch of citations at the bottom, but the nice thing about a dynamic system like this is you can go read it for yourself. Okay. Um, <clears throat> increased alienation. Uh, that basically means a disconnection between, you know, you as an agent, as a person who can like make choices and, and do things in the world versus how things actually function. In other words, you feel disconnected from how you spend your time. Like you don't care about that, right? Because, you know, you, you lose your connection between your interests and the effort you have to undertake. That's the quick sense of what alienation means in this context. There's increased misbehavior. The advocates for corporal punishment think we need good behavior. We need to hit kids to get that behavior. There's an increase in misbehavior. I will note studies have shown in the short term an immediate effect when you hit a kid, you get them immediately to stop right now what they're doing. That is true. But it does not bear long term consequences that are good. It does not perpetuate that behavior, right? It's right now when you're getting hit, you stop doing that thing you, you, know, you got hit for. But tomorrow, later today, in a, in a week, there's increased misbehavior, the studies show. Okay. There's increased motivation for revenge, which is related to this point about aggression. <clears throat> and the state of Mississippi, you know, unlike Kentucky, Kentucky's about eight or nine percent African American. Um, uh, and, and for what it's worth, you know, I'll sometimes use these terms, terms interchangeably. The main difference, as I see it, is someone who is an immigrant from Ghana doesn't refer to themselves as African American. Right, they call themselves black. So that sometimes the data says black, sometimes it says African American for those kinds of reasons. Um, but anyway, so in the state of Mississippi, the, the population is 38% black. The, pop, the, the population that gets hit with corporal punishment in schools is 60% black. The people who suffer corporal punishment are very disproportionately African Americans or black immigrants. So how do we think about this? Philosophy, in my view, can make a big difference in life. It teaches us to think critically. It's, a, it's the domain in which the greatest attention is paid to things like ethics, about what should we be doing. We do this, we do that, the law says this, the law says that, but what should the law say is the important question. The law made slavery legal. Obviously that's not acceptable, right? So what should the law be? These are philosophical questions, right? So um, at the same time, as you'll see in a moment, the most common justification you hear is what? For corporal punishment. 
Why, why, is, why do people think we should use corporal punishment? What have you heard? That's it. Yes? There's also the, uh, the uh, operational conditioning and Pavlovian type. Uh, just the, the psychologists, like, uh, especially back in the day, they're like, oh, yeah, they'll stop doing it if you get it enough. Right, so for those who are online, the answers were first, spare the rod, spoil the child, which is the scriptural, the religious uh, argument that we're going to come to in a moment. And the second response was the sort of Pavlovian reaction, uh, sort of stimulus response. If you stimulate in a certain way, you know, you get the response you want is what's thought. And so the question is, is that prediction correct? And we've studied this extensively. By we, I don't mean a philosopher. I haven't done that empirical work myself, but I've read the empirical work, and there's tons of it. Okay, we'll start with the religious arguments in particular, then we're going to think about promoting the greatest good, because those who talk about this Pavlovian, this, the stimulus response, the, the, the idea that we're going to condition kids to, to behave right, that's a prediction. And the intent is that we'll get the greater good. If we do, the question is, is the prediction right? Is it based on the best knowledge we have? We're going to come to that. So, so you can have different people hold different positions and yet make the same moral argument that's referred to as consequentialism, right? That the good of an action has to do with the consequences of the decision you make, right? But that argument then depends on well, how likely are you in fact to get the consequences that you anticipate? Because if you're terrible at predicting things, you have a worse argument, right? The better you can base what you are arguing on the facts and on studies, well, the stronger is your case. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about promoting the greatest good, which is one of the main dominant moral theories of the modern world. And then we're going to talk about respect for persons, right? There's, there are uglier terms philosophers like to use, like deontology. You may have studied terms like that. Um, but at the end of the day, within a theory like that, my point and focus has to do with what it means to respect a person, what it means to treat a person as someone who should be thought of as deserving of dignity, right, and respect. <clears throat> and then we'll talk about virtue ethics and educational philosophy. In this context, I'm seeing these as intertwined insofar as virtue theory thinks that the purposes uh, of an object or of a subject matter that you're talking about um, are the source from which you can draw insight about what would lead you to flourish in that activity, right? You know, what would be virtuous, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about uh, educational philosophy and virtue together. <clears throat> Next, we're going to focus briefly on vulnerable populations because um, in the modern world, this is a terminology really important in ethics. Um, think about the fact that adults can buy cigarettes with all these warning labels about how it'll kill you. But we have very strict rules about how milk is produced, right? Why? Well, you don't prohibit kids from buying milk, right? And who consumes milk in your household most when you have kids? You know, kids drink a lot of milk, right? So in other words, we're concerned about vulnerable populations. I'll, I'll spell that out more in moral language shortly. And then, and then finally, um, I have some thoughts for you about democratic dialogue, because while philosophers have lots of ideas and, and, and meaningful arguments, it seems to me there's all the reason in the world to draw on the greatest available intelligence that we can. And you get that by engaging experts, by engaging people on the ground, right? Philosophers sometimes are thought to be in the clouds. I try and resist that claim. Nevertheless, when you speak only in theory and not with practitioners, why would you miss out on their insight? Right, so we'll get to that shortly. And that has to do with Kentucky's potential and, and, option, and opportunity. Okay, so beginning with religious arguments. You guys got it exactly right. Just two weeks ago, there was the story about Oklahoma opposing Oklahoma's um, state representatives opposing that bill that I mentioned, which would have prohibited hitting children who are disabled in, in schools. Right. This is a photo of Oklahoma State Representative Jim Olson. Uh, and he opposed, as I said, a fellow. Uh, this, this is a fellow representative, but he's also they're both in the same party. So it's not a, it's not a partisanship issue is my point. Right. 
Uh, John Talley had the House Bill 1028 that was intending to outlaw hitting kids with disabilities. And State Representative Jim Olson raised the following concerns. And you can watch the video on Twitter <laughs> if you wish, or you, or you can, uh, I've got a link at the bottom, you'll see in a second, where you can read the article about this. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. So that would seem to endorse the use of corporal punishment. So how would you reconcile this bill with scripture's counsel on the matter? We're a Bellarmine University, a Catholic institution, right? The perhaps unfortunate picture of a nun wrapping you on the knuckles remains in people's memories pretty strongly, right? <clears throat> Another representative in uh, Oklahoma, Randy Randleman, this was this is what he had to say. You can't touch me. I hear that over and over. I don't want to hear that in school. Why do you think he would say he didn't want to hear kids say you can't touch me? Well, because kids he thinks are being disrespectful. And this is one of the arguments for why people think it's okay to hit kids. Um, in another slide, I've got a link to a web page from Focus on the Family. Christian organization that talks about on their website corporal punishment. One of the legitimate uses of spanking, according to that argument, is to address disrespect. Right? I don't want to hear you can't touch me, right? I want to touch you. It sounds creepy when you say it that way, doesn't it? But um, the point is, no, we're going to discipline you when you're disrespectful. And if you've got the slides, this is the link to that article. I, I may have mentioned it already. But how do you reply to this? I'm not a religious leader, right? Um, I was, you know, educated in, in Catholic Sunday school, <laughs> you know, but um, I refer to other religious arguments presented by others. I mentioned focus on the family on their website. This is where they aim to correct the misconception about spare the rod, spoil the child. Focus on the family is not a liberal organization. They will agree with my assessment, okay? You, in a moment, you'll see a link to their page. If you have the slides, you can go and have a look for yourself, right? They correct the misconception. First of all, is spare the rod, spoil the child in the Bible? According to Focus on the Family, it is not. In fact, it's slightly different. It's, it's, it's a paraphrase, okay? So, I don't think it's, they, they call it a, mis, a misquote. Uh, that's all right, it's, I, I call it a paraphrase, let's be generous. Okay, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Okay, Proverbs 13, 24. But what is the context? What rod are we talking about? Right? It's also called a staff. Can you envision a shepherd punishing a sheep for misbehavior? Maybe that isn't sort of the symbolism that people have in mind. It certainly was focused on the family. And they make this claim. You can follow the link and read it for yourself. Okay? The shepherd taps a sheep. What is the rod for? It's, it's going this way, we're going that way, so that way. No, we're going this way. It's gentle. If you don't think it's gentle, where do we get this line? From Psalm 23, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. Why would they comfort me if you've misbehaved and you've gotten hit? To inflict pain. No, they comfort you because you don't know where to go and you're just going and it's scary. Tap, no, this way. Oh, okay. That's comforting. It's directing. You tell the sheep where you're going. You're not saying, oh, you're a terrible sheep. You're a bad sheep. Let me hit you. That doesn't make sense. I'm not a religious expert. Okay. Surely more can be said about this. I will say, however, that scriptural justifications were offered in favor of slavery. 
Thornton Stringfellow. If you just write Stringfellow and you search scriptural and statistical views in favor of slavery, you will find a book and it's scanned and online, 1856. You can read all the scriptural arguments. Just because they're scriptural arguments doesn't mean it's the way we ought to behave. Okay? There's other ways to interpret it as well. So we have to think. If you're a believer, you believe you were given a mind and conscience. So how do we think these things through? Philosophers study this, these matters as well. And as I mentioned, promoting the greater good for the greatest number, so a theory referred to as consequentialism, the most famous version is referred to as utilitarianism. People like John Stuart Mill, Jeremy Bentham before him, and others, right? What do they have to say? So I don't have a lot to say about this because I've gone over the facts, which are what feed into our ability to predict what outcomes may come, right? The major moral theory says that we should weigh the harms versus the advancement of the good or well-being of the whole, right? And predict which is the better outcome. The psychological and medical science are thoroughly in agreement. And again, not about mere associations, but about causal relations, much harder to show. Okay, and I've got a link. This is the authority. I make arguments about policy and philosophy, right? I was on a panel sitting next to Elizabeth Gershoff. I was invited to talk about this stuff. And boy, was I humble. This lady is the expert. She wrote a bunch of different meta analyses of all the study of studies, essentially. Right? And they have been overwhelmingly persuasive, such that that 67,000 member American Academy of Pediatrics was convinced. And this was the linchpin. The argument, the strength of the causal evidence against physical punishment of children. Ask your psychology professors, how easy is it to show cause psychologically? Ask them that. You know how hard it is if you study it. It's hella hard, pardon my language. I shouldn't use that word here. Uh, it's very hard to show causal relation. And yet, we've got it, okay? Between corporal punishment and adverse life outcomes. You can read the article for yourself, okay? That year, 2018, is when the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with its uh, declaration, okay? <clears throat> and, uh, they, they released in 2019 a resolution on physical discipline of children by parents. That is a more controversial matter. I'm talking about the state. I'm talking about schools, right? What parents are going to do is a more complex matter of liberty and religious freedom than what the state should be allowed to do. I'm not saying I don't have views on the matter, but my argument is about American schools. Generally, I focus on public schools, um, but the difference between public and private schools is a lot blurrier than most people think. I can get into that if you wish. Perhaps that's for the Q&A, right? If, if you want to get into that. Uh, but I'm focusing on schooling in which there is a sanctioning. There is a sense in which people who are educated profoundly in advancing the well-being of our kids are engaging in a practice profoundly misguided, in my view, not just in my view. And so if that's the case, why wouldn't parents do it obviously also? If it's not legal in schools, well, then that's an interesting matter we can, we can talk about the next step, but it's more debatable. And, and um, at present, my, my scope of my project is to focus on schools. So here's from the American Psychological Association, right? The use of physical di discipline predicts increases, not decreases. Uh, uh, oh, that is supposed to be in, uh, in. sorry, I, I removed it, I uh, made a mistake. <laughs> predicts increases, not decreases, in children's behavioral problems over time. Alternative parenting approaches that teach positive parenting skills and deliver information intended to foster 
um, attitude change have demonstrated their effectiveness in helping parents raise their kids more effectively in line with their goals and to reduce children's undesirable behavior. So if you're arguing about the promotion of the good of our children, the people who study this stuff, including psychological association, but also the major association of, of pediatricians, agree. It is not controversial in these organizations. There is a very recent association that was formed. It's hard not to say that it was in order to represent a political point of view that's different. There's an association called the American College of Pediatricians that was launched in 2019. Its two main tenets have to do with gender and sex related issues and corporal punishment. They present a different view. They have 500 members. That means in each state, there's an average of 10. Imagine living in California and there's 10. Can you find 10 people in California? Sure. We'll hold a view like that, regardless of the evidence. Yes, this is a political ploy, right? The Association of Pediatricians is the American Association of, of Pediatrics. American Pediatrics. Anyway, so um, the next uh, theoretical framework is, has to do with respect for persons. I'm going to go through the major theories to show that, as far as I can tell, any most important major theory in ethics opposes corporal punishment. Respect for persons. Um, in 2016, when I first came to Kentucky, uh, I had come from Mississippi, where there's the highest proportion of corporal punishment, and I'd written about it there in my scholarship, and I would publish pieces in the newspaper, because I think it's important. Philosophers, sure, can enjoy being in the clouds and have fun with a pickle like Zeno's Paradox or something like that. You can have fun with all that stuff, but we can also say, you know what, it's pretty important for us to talk to other people about these issues that are affecting our children, right? When you know, learn about Plato's cave, remember, there's people back in there. We need to go engage them, or right? we need to be engaged in the public square, right? So from time to time, I publish an op-ed like this one, uh, prisoners better protected from corporal punishment than students. If you committed murder, Dylan Roof murdered nine people in Charleston in church, right? He can't be hit in prison by the state. The one exception, of course, is the ultimate, right? You can be put to death by the state in America. But you, but you can't be spanked. You get lethal injection, but you can't be struck with a rod in prison, unless in self-defense for the guards. Right? So kids aren't afforded that protection, which we refer to as security of person. The Supreme Court came out saying children do not have the right to security of person. So you might say, well, the law says, my response, that legal interpretation is morally wrong. And laws change. Court decisions changed. You can just read the newspaper lately. You'll read lots about court changes and decisions. The fundamental document that I'll be drawing on and talking about respect for persons is was um, published in 1979, the Belmont Report. It was a report which laid out ethical principles and guidelines for the protection of human subjects of research. The reason for this is that scientists had done some awful things to people. If you've ever heard of the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, you may know that African American men, right, were infected with syphilis and were denied treatment so that we could study syphilis. Unbeknownst to them. It's ridiculous. We've, we've done horrible things. There's lots of other examples we can give. The point is, if the federal government is going to fund research, 
my goodness, we should have some moral principles which guide what kind of research we can do. We can do awful things, and you shouldn't do that with my tax dollars, let alone at all. Right? So the Belmont Report was generated by a committee including a couple of wonderful philosophers and a number of people from different areas of expertise. And the first basic principle they lay out in the Belmont Report has to do with respect for persons. It, this is about the guidance of decision making about what's ethical for human research. But ask yourself, is, should it be any different when we're talking about the treatment of kids in schools? Here we go. Respect for persons incorporates at least two ethical convictions. First, that individuals should be treated as autonomous agents, and second, that persons with diminished autonomy are entitled to protection. The principle of respect for persons thus divides into two separate moral requirements, the requirement to acknowledge autonomy and the requirement to protect those with diminished autonomy. I don't have a matter on the slide about this, but I'm going to fill in a matter that I realized perhaps would have been good to add. What is autonomy? Auto is self, nomos is legislation. Ruling yourself. You should be able to make your own decisions. You don't want to be in a study, you shouldn't have to be in the study. You want to get out of the study, you should always be let out of the study. Right? You should be made aware of what you're getting into such that you can make proper decision making for yourself. Right? But a child is thought not to have full autonomy. We don't blame a four-year-old to the full extent that we would an adult for shooting his relative with a gun he happened upon. It's terrible, it's tragic, it's awful. But a four-year-old didn't know what he was doing, right? You shouldn't incarcerate a four-year-old for life for murder. Doesn't make sense, right? They, they're not capable of that full understanding. So, because kids don't have autonomy, they're often treated as less than fully human, which is why people think you got to hit them until they grow up enough because they're not autonomous. They're not fully there. That's part of the reason people think we should hit kids is they're little animals. You got to beat the devil out of them is the language, right? Well, in fact, autonomy, my problem with much of this thinking is that autonomy is often thought of something that you sort of you sort of gain upon full reaching full adulthood. But as a matter of fact, it's clearly a matter in development. You know that there are some 14 year olds who are far more adults than some 22 year olds, you know, right? Like that's possible. It may be rare, but it's true, right? There are some young people well under the age of 18 who are convicted as adults, perhaps unfairly, sometimes perhaps not for a crime, right? So we know 18 is essentially an arbitrary number. People also say your full development hasn't completed until your 20s, right? There's all these kinds of debates and issues, right? The point is autonomy is a matter that grows over time. And that means that a child has some ability to self-legislate. Not full, like an adult, right? But they're in development. So we shouldn't disregard that. Now, the Belmont Report, however, notes that even persons with diminished autonomy should be respected. And in fact, not just respected, they should be protected. A person of diminished autonomy should be protected more than a person with autonomy. Right? Why don't we hit prisoners? Because it's cruel. And unusual. I, I, I don't like that language because if you just make it more usual, that doesn't make it okay, right? So it's just the histor history of the language, cruel and unusual. But, but if it's cruel, we shouldn't do it. Why are we doing it to children then? Um, for a, 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 a robust argument about rights and deontology that I mentioned that is associated most often with respect for persons, there's a great book. Uh, by Patrick Lenta, in which he argues against corporal punishment uh, in a philosophical assessment focused on rights. Things like security of persons. The United Nations is clear 
countless nations around the world prohibit corporal punishment. Scandinavian countries prohibited it back in, gosh, was it the 70s or the 80s? I can look it up. I'm sorry, I don't remember. Ran off the cuff here. But, uh, but nations around the world have declarations of the rights of children. The United States is one of the few nations that hasn't ratified that. Why? Because we want to protect parents' rights to behave religiously or not in how they want to do what they want to do to their kids. They're worried about interference. And maybe you are too. But what are you worried about? Being criticized for being cruel, maybe. Maybe we shouldn't be cruel. Virtue, ethics, and educational philosophy in this context, I think, converge, importantly. My expertise focuses especially on John Dewey's philosophy. John Dewey was America's public philosopher. That's the sub subject of the last book I put out. It was a collection of his public writings. He's sort of a role model for me in many ways. As a philosopher who was profoundly publicly engaged, very influential, he was on a stamp at a time when it really meant something. Today, like anything, can be on a stamp, right? Uh, but at the time, you know, you had to like have a, an artist do a rendition and etch and so on. And they, anyway, well, that's a big deal to me. A philosopher was on the stand uh, at a point in time. Anyway, so the great educational philosopher John Dewey, right? He, he frequently made this argument that the ends of democracy, which means the goals, the aims, the values, what, you, what you're trying to get in democracy, right? They need to guide the means to democracy. What does that mean? That means how you go about trying to get it, how, what you do should be democratic if you're trying to have ends that are democratic. He frequently made this argument in opposition to Soviet Russia, right, or the communist Russia, excuse me, because they said they were after democracy. They said what we're after is, is communism, this situation in which we're going to have democracy. They, the communists argued for democracy. Their means by which they wanted to pursue it was through dictatorship. And we thought that doesn't make sense. That's not a way to get it. You're going to be undemocratic to get them democracy? No, it, it makes no sense. Right? But by the same token, he was a profoundly important in terms of influence and, and contribution educational philosopher in education. If you're going to have democracy in education, right? And this is his famous book, it's called Democracy in Education. You need your means to reflect your ends, right? How do you treat people with respect? How do you empower people? Demos people, crassy power. How do you empower people in education, right? Is hitting them consistent with that aim? Aristotle, virtue ethical thinker, very influential, and Dewey was influenced by many moral philosophers, but including some virtue ethicists, right? Aristotle thought the way you become virtuous, the way you become ethical, is by behaving ethically, is by is by doing those things. If you want to be courageous, well, challenge yourself frequently to do the thing that's kind of scary to you that you think is right. You know, if you want to be a good tennis player, well. Try and have good form and repeatedly kind of practice that form. And all of a sudden, it's just happy. You don't even need to think about it anymore. You're a good tennis player, right? My son is learning baseball. And it's challenging at first to figure out all the stance and why do I have to do this and so forth, right? You got to turn your hips first before the bat comes, right? It, it's not intuitive. You got to learn this stuff. And how do you become good at swinging a bat? By learning the proper motions and practicing it a bunch of times, right? So in schools, how do you have a virtuous school? How do you have a good school? How do you have a school for democracy that's to empower people, right? Behave in ways that empower people. Does hitting you make you feel empowered? Think about it. Maybe a tap, say, I don't go this way, like that other interpretation of scripture, but not causing pain. If we wish to teach virtue, we need to exemplify it. When we behave violently in the resolution of our conflicts, we teach others to do the same. That's why in the studies, right? Corporal punishment, B 
begets increased aggression. There was recently a, one of those New Yorker drawings in which there's a lady sitting next to her daughter and they're both on their phones, right? And they're sitting next to another lady and her daughter who each have books open and are reading. And the lady on her phone says to the mother with the book, I don't understand how you get your kid to read books. And it's funny because the mother's exemplifying the behavior. Okay, it wasn't funny. Right, I thought it was funny when I saw it. Right? Behave in ways that you want your kids to exemplify. There's no guarantee. They may rebel against you, of course. But as we say, the, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Right? Kids are an awful lot like their parents very often. And where else are they going to get their understanding of what makes sense in terms of how to live? Well, school is one answer, of course. Hence, let's do the things differently. As Aristotle would say, human beings are rational and social animals, so we should educate by means of reason and social guidance. Do we frequently argue that violence is the frustration of another's ends? He also argued in another context that violence is a is sort of by definition the clearest instance of the failure of intelligence. He made that argument especially in his um, advocacy against war in a number of contexts. He thought war was the clearest demonstration of the failure of human intelligence. Why can't we resolve our problems without this? Right? It's a failure of intelligence here. Now, I mentioned vulnerable populations. I think I mentioned milk, right? The Belmont Report in 1979 talked about vulnerable populations. Those Tuskegee syphilis experiments, right? Targeted vulnerable populations. Here's what the Belmont Report says. Remember, it's about study on, of human subjects in research, okay? The question is, does this analogously teach us something? about public schooling. And by the way, it's very frequent for people to draw on research ethics or medical ethics to see insight for education. This is a common practice because the contexts are very analogous. One special instance of injustice results from the involvement of vulnerable subjects. Certain groups, such as racial minorities, the economically disadvantaged, the very sick and the institutionalized may continually be sought as research subjects owing to their ready availability in settings where research is conducted. Given their dependent status and their frequently compromised capacity for free consent, they should be protected against the danger of being involved in research solely for administrative convenience or because they are easy to manipulate as a result of their illness or socioeconomic condition. The perfect people to study, if you want to do a controlled study, are prison inmates. You control the environment. You can control their movement. You can control what they eat. You can control who they're around. Perfect. Let's do our science there. No, right? This is a profound opposition to the Belmont Report. It's one of the sort of strongest examples where people are concerned about taking advantage of the easy manipulation of inmates, especially because we don't see them, right? It's very hard to do studies on inmates without significant oversight of inter internal review boards, and it should be hard, right? Because these are vulnerable populations. Who else is hard to study? I'm in a college of education. I don't do the empirical studies that I'm the philosopher, but I, as I say, I collaborate on them and I, and I study them carefully. Um, but my colleagues have a hard time studying kids in schools. Similarly, there's an environment, they're sort of in that place for a certain amount of time, they're manipulable, they're young, they don't have full autonomy, right? They're very vulnerable. So it's actually pretty hard to study students. I mean, in K-12, it's a heck of a lot easier to study y'all, right? Because you're adults, you have autonomy, right? And you are voluntarily present. I mean, I don't know how much compulsion people put on you to be here today. Uh, but, right? 
the point is you didn't have to be here if you don't want to be, right? And and you're adults. Uh, and so if you've been studying a lot, that's why. Maybe you haven't experienced that. As I've said already before, black and boys and disabled children are disproportionately targeted in uses of corporal punishment, and children in general are a vulnerable population. Stacy Patton is a wonderful journalist and professor at Oregon State University, uh, and she published a book called Spare the Kids, Why Whooping Children Won't Save Black America. She's a fantastic writer, very interesting figure. One of the reasonable cautions some of my black colleagues have had when I make arguments about corporal punishment is they're worried that my arguments as a white man might influence people to be upset about, punish, whatever, black parents who are hitting kids. That's a reasonable concern, right? Stacy Patton is making an important argument, right? As an African-American scholar to make advocacy, not to punish people who are doing this, but to say, hey, why don't we try a different practice? The point's not about punishing parents or teachers. The point is, let's think about how we can do things to promote the good as best we can, right? So democratic dialogue, I, I need to go a little bit faster given the time I see. Um, democratic dialogue, why focus on this? So um, a common response we get when we talk about corporal punishment, scholars, is that you know you, want, you just say we sh shouldn't do this, we shouldn't do this, but what should we do? People need training on what to do. Well, for what it's worth, every year, educators have to undergo professional development training. We already do this every year. Would it be expensive to have a given year focus on corporal punishment? We're already going to spend the money to do a training. Why don't we do it about, about alternative practices, right? Plus, 31 states don't use corporal punishment. You think we've got a couple examples about how to do things differently? We do. Okay? Food. Now, I'm not a great expert on these yet. I'm learning about these still, right? The good behavior game, the four R's, which include respect and resolution, uh, promoting alternative thinking strategies, paths, and the most famous, right, is PBIS, which stands for um, Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports. 26,000 schools in America use PBIS as their method. My argument is not for a particular alternative, except that we should have ideally the least harmful or most beneficial alternative we can have. Why do I say that? Because there are other forms of punishment that are also harmful. Suspension from school means you get set back and you come back to school, you're more frustrated, you're struggling, right? So we need alternative mechanisms, okay? Um, so my argument is, let's have meetings and professional development trainings that we're already going to have where we focus on discussions with teachers, administrators, scholars, and community members to talk about which of the practices already in use in the state, which beget better consequences. And we can deal with the issue, oh, your school is different from ours. Well, yeah, but we've got a lot of schools. We can talk about this, right? Let's explore which are the best options. And we can have these meetings at little to no cost. So what's Kentucky's potential then? Right? We, we almost have stopped using corporal punishment. Trends can change, though, as we saw in Missouri. Right? We're close to being done with this. Who can say we have to use this practice when there were only 17 cases in the last reported year? Clearly, this isn't needed any longer. Okay, we're very close to ending the practices. We can look to other states. What can we do? Number one, organize intentional dialogues, as I've said. Right. Number two, we can pass legislation to prohibit the use of corporate punishment in schools, right? And uh, and to expect, you know, positive behavioral guidance. Okay. We can invite educational leaders from other states to the, the ones that practice corporate punishment to visit Kentucky, to observe, to dialogue with us, and maybe to have some bourbon. That was not a funny joke, but it was intended. It was intended. Right. What are the principles that should guide our decision making about behavioral? Guidance then, right? I realize I said guidance twice. So whichever frameworks we choose, right? We need to keep in mind, schools are compulsory. 
Y'all don't have to be here. K-12 kids do, at least to a certain age. Okay? When that's compulsory, you got to think about, are you making school prison? Are you making it inviting, a place that fosters the empowerment of people? Right? That takes a kind of culture. Hitting kids in a school has a profound effect on the culture. Schools should promote the greatest benefit and, and, and avoid or minimize any harm. That's sort of a general principle. They should respect students developing autonomy and dignity as persons. Model rational, social, and emotional virtue maximally conducive for learning. Show kids the kind of behavior you want from them, not a behavior you wouldn't want them to replicate on others. Strive to protect our most vulnerable populations from harm, especially historically, you know, groups historically subjected to injustice. And keep center to mind the available evidence and research that we have already available, which is inclusive. Thank you so much for coming today, and I would welcome and invite your thoughts. You can email me. I'm on Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff, and you can get the slides if you like. I would love to hear any comments, questions, or challenges that you have. Thank you.